Aloha and welcome to Queen's free Speaking of Health lectures series. November, you think it's Thanksgiving, right? The month of Thanksgiving, but it is also National Diabetes Awareness Month. And guess what? Today is, does anyone know? World Diabetes Day. So it's pretty amazing that you have all this focus and attention on diabetes because it is such a growing epidemic. So it's affecting lives, not just here in Hawaii, nationally and also globally. So the good news is that you guys are taking action right now, tonight, by getting more information. And our lecture for today is called Living with Diabetes, How to Take Control. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker for this evening, Dr. Lisa L. Wong. If I could have you stand. She is an endocrinologist and a courtesy staff member at the Queen's Medical Center. She has a bachelor's degree in biology from Columbia University. For medical school, she went to the University of Hawaii John A. Burns School of Medicine. She did her internal medicine residency and endocrine fellowship at Georgetown University. In 2002, she joined her father's practice, Dr. Terry Wong, who is an endocr endocrinologist at the Queen's Medical Center. She has two children, ages 13 and 15. She says she loves taking care of patients who have diabetes, but alas, she's not taking new patients at this time. Yes, and then we like to play this game. What school, what high school you went go? So what high school do you think she went to? Anyone guess? Punahou, she went, wow, she went to Punahou. Please welcome Dr. Lisa Wong. Thank you for the warm welcome and good evening. I'm, I'm glad that you all came out to hear about diabetes and learn something new. Uh, I just wanted to get a feel for where you're at. So if you could raise your hand, how many of you have type 2 diabetes? Okay, okay thank you. And how, how many of you have type 1 diabetes? Anybody? Okay. And how many of you have a loved one with diabetes? All right. Okay, good. Well, let's get started. I hope, I hope you find this interesting and, and that you learn something. Let's see. So as you know, diabetes is very common. In 2015, three, 30 million Americans, or 9.4% of the population, had diabetes. Of these, about a quarter were undiagnosed. So 7.2 million Americans didn't even know they had diabetes. 1.5 million Americans are diagnosed with diabetes every year, and diabetes remains the seventh leading cause of death in the US. It's a very expensive disease, so that last year the costs were estimated to be $327 billion. And people with diabetes have medical expenses that are two about two times higher than those who do not have diabetes. It's very expensive. Um, in Hawaii here, about 13.1% of the population, uh, the adult population has diabetes. And every year, 8,000 people are diagnosed with diabetes in Hawaii. So I'm sure all of us have friends or relatives that are touched by this disease, and, and that's why you're here. So it's great. Uh, how do we diagnose diabetes? Oh, this way. So for several years, the way to diagnose diabetes was with a blood test, and you could either diagnose with a fasting plasma glucose of 126 or higher. So if, let's say you went to your doctor and had a cholesterol test that you needed to fast for, and in addition, uh, the other tests that were ordered included a glucose, and that glucose was 126 or higher, then you would meet the criteria of having diabetes. The other criteria would be if you had a random plasma glucose of 200 or an oral glucose tolerance test, some, somewhat like a woman who has been ch checked for gestational diabetes, a pregnant woman, um, you would drink some glucose, oral glucose, and then have your plasma glucose checked an hour or two later. So if that, if that level was 200 or greater, you would also meet the criteria for diabetes. So in 2010, the ADA and several other um, organizations decided to add 
the hemoglobin A1C as another diagnostic criteria. So if your hemoglobin A1C is 6.5% or higher, you also have diabetes. And I just wanted to call your attention to the, the definition of prediabetes. So if your hemoglobin A1C is 5.7 to 6.4%, you meet the criteria for prediabetes. Um, if your fasting glucose is between 100 and 125, you also meet the criteria for prediabetes. And there's a large population with prediabetes, which puts you at risk for developing diabetes in the future. So how many of you know what uh, hemoglobin A1C is? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. How many people know what, what your own hemoglobin A1C is? Okay, good, good. So that's important. So when we talk about diabetes, I think it's important for everyone to understand what that uh, blood test is. So the hemoglobin A1C is simply hemoglobin, which is bound to circ circulating glucose. So the red blood cell lifespan is 120 days. So it's approximately three months. And so it gives us an estimate of the average glucose for the past three months, okay? So if that hemoglobin A1C is 6.5% or higher, you meet the criteria for diabetes. So it's, it's good if you already have diabetes, you sh really should know what your hemoglobin A1C is. And if you don't, you should ask your doctor what it is and know it. You know, write, write the number down, write the date down and track it because that's what's going to help you determine if you're in good control or if you're in target. These are some common symptoms of hyperglycemia. So often I see patients who are newly diagnosed. So you know they have no history of diabetes and uh, they are experiencing symptoms. So some folks tell me they're very, they're extremely thirsty, they're urinating all the time, um, they're very hungry, and yet they, they are losing weight. And so it seems like a paradox, but the weight loss is actually caused by glucosuria, which is excretion of glucose through the urine. So their urine is high levels of glucose, so they're, they're losing calories, and that's why they present with weight loss. Um, and these are some typical symptoms to just know if maybe a friend or loved one is experiencing these kind of symptoms. And these would be excessive. So, you know, large volumes of urine, extremely thirsty, um, many pounds weight loss. The other symptoms that are not uh, listed on the slide include blurred vision and fatigue. So hyperglycemia, high blood glucose levels can make you very tired. And, and many people have blurred vision. So sometimes you'll people will go to the eye doctor and get their eyes checked, and then they'll, they'll discover that it was the diabetes all along. So um, if you're getting a new pair of glasses and you have blurred vision because of very high glucose levels, it's not a good time to get your prescription because we want to wait till your glucose levels normalize and you're gonna, your, your prescription will change. So, so these symptoms really occur at very high levels of plasma glucose. So, probably 200 to 300. So you may have diabetes at a lower level where your blood glucose is only running maybe 140s to 160s and not have any of these symptoms. In fact, my next slide says many, many people have absolutely no symptoms. And so that's the tricky part of this disease is that you may feel perfectly healthy and, and not realize you have diabetes and not understand why it's a problem because you're functioning well, you're feeling great, um, and yet it's a chronic silent disease. And, and as we'll discuss further, this high blood glucose can cause organ damage. So briefly, I'll just discuss the pathophysiology of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, type 1 diabetes is not as common here in Hawaii as type 2, but um, it begins with an autoimmune destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas, so the islet cells in the pancreas. And these are the insulin-producing cells. So 
when I say autoimmune destruction, your own immune system thinks that those cells are foreign and produces white blood cells, antibodies, and these destroy those um, islet cells. And the result is that you are insulin deficient. And so in turn, you have very high glucose levels. You're not able to use that glucose and you're not able to transport that glucose into your cells where they belong because you're insulin deficient. And this is a very simple, simplified diagram for type 2 diabetes. So um, in the normal figure on the left, you can see the pancreas produces insulin, and this insulin moves glucose into the cells. In the patient with diabetes, you have, if you want to really make it simple, you have two, two problems. One is that your pancreas is not making enough insulin, and that your cells are resistant to the insulin that is being produced. So, in, so both cause elevations in the glucose levels. Now, this slide is um, more complex and tells m more of a full story of what's going on. So I'm just going to go through it because it's very interesting, um, and I think it helps us understand a, little, a glimpse of what's going on. So really, it begins with insulin resistance, and I'm talking about type 2 diabetes, at the level of the skeletal muscle and the adipocyte, which is the fat cell, so on the lower right-hand corner of the slide. So these tissues are very resistant to insulin. And so in response, the pancreas produces lots of insulin. We call it hyperinsulinemia. And so many people are walking around with normal glucose levels, no diabetes, and yet, and, and usually these folks are obese, um, it's because their pancreas is working overtime. And the pancreas is producing so much insulin to try and keep that glucose in the normal range. And what we know is that those high insulin levels are really deleterious to cause tumors, cause cardiovascular disease. Um, and so and that's sort of the very preliminary problem. Now, what is just as important as the pancreas in this disease is the liver. So you see on the left lower hand corner, the liver is responsible for producing glucose. So if you have no diabetes, then when you eat carbohydrate, your liver actually suppresses glucose production. So your glucose production at that point is zero. And then on the other hand, if you have diabetes, your liver is inappropriately producing too much glucose. So it's not suppressing as it should, your glucose. Um, so you're having both, you, you're having the hyperinsulinemia and then you're having excess glucose production. Then over time what happens is that your pancreas becomes fatigued. And they, call, they have a term called beta cell exhaustion where your pancreas just is, is, it's done. It's not going to produce any more insulin. And usually this occurs maybe a decade or two after diagnosis, so it's later in the disease. And so initially you start off with a pancreas that's working very hard to produce a lot of insulin, but 10, 20 years later, that pancreas is just not making enough insulin. And so you actually become, a type 2 patient can become insulin deficient. So those, those two problems at the, the level of the liver and the pancreas are also contributing to hyperglycemia. And last, I'll just mention the gut. So the very top of the uh, slide there is a picture of the stomach and the intestines. And so about, let's see, about, about over 10 years ago, we, it came to our realization um, that there is something called the incretin effect, where the, the gut actually speaks to the pancreas and the liver and that there are hormones that communicate to these two organs to cause more insulin to be secreted and less glucose to be produced in response to carbohydrate. And so a lot of the drugs are targeted at these different levels. And so as you can see, it's a complex multi-organ problem, and that's why it's difficult to treat. That's one of the reasons it's difficult to treat. This slide's really interesting. So this is we always show this slide to the physicians when we 
present uh, talk about diabetes. And I think it's, it's good to see. It's, it's uh, showing the natural history of type 2 diabetes over time on the x-axis and then looking at the plasma glucose level on the y-axis. So, so at the start, you have beta cell function very high in the blue line, very high. And that's what's keeping your glucose levels in check. And so really, your fasting glucose might be normal, might be at 100, the red line. But over time, as insulin resistance progresses, and that's the yellow line, insulin resistance occurs because of genetics, because of obesity, because of a sedentary lifestyle. And then, uh, and then the beta cell function that I was talking about, that, that beta cell exhaustion or fatigue, that occurs over time, as you see it just dramatically dip down, that's when you're going to see the fasting glucose rise. Prior to that, before that even happens, you're having increased levels of post-meal glucose. So first you're going to see, you should say normal glucose levels, then you're going to see higher postprandial glucose or, or higher sugars after you eat, and then later, when maybe at the, by the time of the diagnosis, you're pretty far into this graph, your fasting glucose is elevated. So, so a lot has happened even before your diagnosis. So you may be familiar with the complications, and that, that's why we are always talking about the importance of good glycemic control is to prevent these complications. So it's really diabetes is the number one cause of blindness in the United States, um, kidney failure uh, for folks who are end-stage renal disease on dialysis, um, you can also develop diabetic neuropathy, so folks getting amputations, um, other complications. And that's all on the left column. On the right column, folks with diabetes are clearly at higher risk for heart attack, stroke, um, peripheral vascular disease. So those high insulin levels and hyperglycemia affect the endothelial lining of these vessels. And so um, folks are much, much higher risk for for the uh, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease. This is just a slide showing that the, the microvascular complications, the ones on the left uh, of the previous slide, are correlated with your A1C. So as your hemoglobin A1C rises, your rates of diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy also rise. I think you may be familiar with that. These two slides are, are a bit wordy, but I found this so interesting, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, you know, a lot of the recommendations for hemoglobin A1C come out of a study called the DCCT, which was published in the New England Journal in 1993. It really, it was a study of type 1 diabetes. So there were 1,400 patients, and they were studied over 10 years from 83 to 93. And they were divided into two groups. So one group received intensive therapy. So they tried to achieve an A1C as close to normal as possible. They were on three or more daily insulin injections or a continuous um, in, insulin infusion, like an insulin pump. Um, and they were, check, they were checking their blood glucose levels four or more times a day. And most of, uh, many of these folks achieved an A1C of seven or less. Um, the other were treated with one or two insulin injections a day, and they averaged an A1C closer to nine. So um, intensive therapy lasts about six and a half years. And so immediately, and like the previous slide I showed you, there were obvious benefits in the folks that were well-controlled. They had much less microvascular complications. But what was interesting is that more than 10 years after that study was complete, both groups just were receiving standard of care. So they, they had similar care. They, won't, they weren't in that intensive therapy. They weren't receiving that intensive therapy anymore. But there were still benefits in that group that received the tight control initially. And they call it metabolic memory, or they call it legacy effect. And so my, what my message is to you is that when you have very good control, there are benefits that are far-reaching into the future is what we believe. And, and really the rest of this slide just says this, that there was study in patients with type 2 diabetes that this 
similar, similar idea. So, um, can I live a long, full life with diabetes? I think a lot of my patients who are diagnosed with diabetes are discouraged and um, wonder what, their, what this means for their future quality of life. And so I'm here to tell you that, yes, you are, you are able to live a very healthy, full life with diabetes. Um, but I really, I think the number one thing to do is accept your diagnosis. And, you know, um, far too many times I see folks who are in denial, and so they don't want to believe it or they don't want to think about it because it's a lot of work. I mean, it's really, it's a full-time job. If, if, if your diabetes is uncontrolled and you want to get it under control, it takes a lot of work. So, um, so really, the first thing to do is look it square in the eye and, and own it. Um, I think being, you, you all here already demonstrated that you're interested and you're engaged and you want to educate yourself. So that, that's a step in the right direction because really it's one of the diseases that is going to be better the more you know and because a lot of it is in your hands day to day, your you know, health care provider is not going to be with you uh, to, to make sure you take your medication. You're going to decide what to eat. You're going to decide how to um, exercise. Um, and then, and then I do notice there's a lot of um, folks that are blaming them, to, or they feel they feel like it's their fault. You know, it's because I wasn't good enough in my diet and exercise. That's why my diabetes is this way. But what I'll say is that diabetes is a very heterogeneous disease, so that one person's diabetes can be very different from another, and a lot of it has to do with your genetics. So. Um, you know, I mean, the nice thing is there are so many good resources now that make it very treatable and, and make your quality of life um, better with that. Um, so so I, I have on here, what are you willing to give up to get something better? So I think, I think of it as an investment, and I think I know that's why you're all here too. But, you know, are you, are you willing to, sa you, it is a sacrifice. If you're going to really take good care of it, are you willing to sacrifice time, energy, to invest in your future health? Um, so, so that's something too you want to think about. What what motivates you to take good care of yourself? Um, so the cornerstone, if you look at the American Diabetes uh, Association um, guidelines, the cornerstone and the first step is lifestyle modification. I think you all know that as well. But um, exercise, um, and that could be different for every person. Um, but become more active, diet, um, stress management. So a lot of my patients are caregivers, and they are either working um, more than one job, or they are caregiving for um, older parents, aunties, maybe, or their children. And, and so it's the stress alone can cause hyperglycemia. So the more you can take time for yourself, to, you know, you, the better caregiver you're going to be. So I think stress management is important. Um, and then if, as much as you can to maintain a normal body weight, which is easier said than done, but, but that's important um, for good glycemic control. And then the other is monitor your, you know, know what your glucose is, know what your A1C is, um, your weight, even your blood pressure and cholesterol, which I didn't have on here. Um, so this is a funny cartoon. It just says... Um, the nation faces rising rates of type 2 diabetes, and um, this fellow here is drinking some insulin and eating up, and he says, I'm learning to manage my type 2 diabetes with insulin. So, you know, there are so many medications to treat diabetes now, but, but again, um, it's, it's lifestyle first. So, so this is a little slide um, showing that, you know, here the... Uh, the doctor, the nurse, the healthcare providers are trying to mop up the, the water and the leak that's overflowing from the sink in the background. But um, is anyone just going to turn off the faucet? So, I mean, it's easy to throw a lot of medication, um, but we need to go to the source of the problem. So really start, start from the beginning. Um, so exercise. Um, it, it is recommended that you exercise 30 minutes five times a week. Um, if you can, 
This was a newer recommendation by the ADA. So folks who are in office jobs, who are sedentary, prolonged sitting should be interrupted with bouts of light activity every 30 minutes for blood glucose benefits. And so they suggest leg lifts or extensions, overhead arm stretches, desk chair swivels, torso twists, side lunges, walking in place. So these, none of these are very strenuous, um, you know, just simple things. And I think now with everyone on uh, electronics and devices, it's easy to just get sucked in and you don't realize how much time's going by, but just to get up and move. I think um, you can put a timer in your phone or just remind yourself to do that. Let's see. Um, these are all, all, any of these are acceptable. So whatever you enjoy, whatever you're going to do, um, aerobic training, walking, cycling, jogging, swimming, um, resistance, exercises, free weights, um, elastic bands, tai chi, yoga, flexibility, balance. Um, it's also recommended to do, you can do this also, two, two and a half hours of moderate to vigorous physical activity, activity every week and try to exercise on at least three days a week. When you exercise, your muscles are able to use that insulin better and your glucose will come down. Okay, and then we move on to diet. So um, this is a cartoon. It says, resistance training is just as important as cardio. Train yourself to resist chocolate, pastries, fried food, beer, and pizza. Um, you know, this is, this is probably the most difficult part is, is what, you know, what can I eat? So, um, and actually out there in the um, ADA booth, the Hawaii ADA booth, they had these beautiful um, flyers with uh, plan your portions. And it, it just shows how much of that plate is vegetables. So this is, this is a Hawaiian one. There's red cabbage, green beans. There's a little Kahlua pork here. Um, and then suggestion on all the vegetables. And here's one that's for Asian food. So, but look how much of that plate is, is vegetables. Here's fish and a little bit and some rice. Um, so this is, <laughs> I just put on here, I mean, this is what is convenient. This is what kids like to eat. Um, and it tastes good, right? Um, this is what we should be eating. So whole foods. So anything that's not packaged, you know, that's coming from the ground, really, I mean, you can't go wrong with vegetables. So vegetables, there's fiber, there's antioxidants, there's vitamins. Um, really, they're low calorie, they're low carbohydrate. So um, they're really the best thing for you. Um, this is our typical. <laughs> so if you look on this plate, there's rice, which is carbohydrate, starch, mac salad, which is carbohydrate. There's protein. I don't know if that's pork katsu, chicken katsu, and, and you know, there's oil. But there's, maybe there's a little lettuce on there, <laughs> but there's not much, you know, colorful green, you know, vegetables. So that's, it's just that that's, that's the choice we have and that's what's available, but it takes an effort. It really takes meal planning. Um, so this is what, avocado is great. Um, this is what I cooked for my kids a couple weeks ago when I made this. Slide. So I didn't put my, I didn't show the rice, but, <laughs> but we did have rice. But this is, you know, just make an effort to eat that way. Um, so I have some suggestions on this. And really, this, you can look on here too, and it has very similar, um, just suggestions for you to think of that, that would be good choices. So vegetables, like I said, avocado's got really good fat, um, protein. So really protein and vegetables are low glycemic index, they're low carbohydrate. The fruits are good as long as you are careful with the portion size um, because they, there are, they are carbohydrates as well. Fish is good. So if you can be cognizant of your carbohydrate intake, um, that's key. Now, you know, each one of you is in a different place. So, you know, you want to individualize it and talk to your physician. But in general, it, like if your A1C is in the 8 to 10 range, if your blood glucose is 200, 300, really decreasing your carbohydrate intake is going to benefit you. I mean, if your A1C is just 6% or 7% and you're 80 years old, you don't need to lose weight, you know, if you're, if you're not overweight. But I'm just saying in general, um, if you want to get your glucose better, 
usually it's, it's less carbohydrate intake. Um, let's see. We talked about, yeah, processed food. Restaurant, a lot of my patients are mainly eating their meals at restaurants. And so if you're able to eat more meals at home, it's going to be healthier. And so, you know, if you can make an effort to do that, even bring your home lunch to work or just say, okay, we're only going to eat out so many days of the week. Just, you know, it's so, it's so convenient, but really um, you're going to have more control over what you eat. It's going to be healthier choices. And meal planning. So that's, again, it's going to take time. So, you, you know, rather than just grab and go, you want to think ahead, like, what are we going to eat and plan it out? I think the meal planning is important. Okay, so I know I told you that having a lower A1C is important. Um, but, and, and really, that was the recommendation for many years, that everyone should try to achieve an A1C below 7%. But um, for several years now, we have changed in, in our recommendation, and, it, and it's an individualized target. So, and this, this comes out of the ADA guidelines as well. So if, um, depending on your situation, your A1C target for one person might be totally different than another person. And if you want to look up um, a, a study called ACCORD, A-C-C-O-R-D, out of the NIH, um, I believe it was 2011, that's where um, a study was done in type 2 diabetics, older patients with other medical problems, looking at very tight, intensive A1C reduction, like below, below seven, well below 7% and higher. And they actually stopped the study early because there were more deaths in the tightly controlled group. So, you know, and we're, you know, there's some controversy as to why, but we know hypoglycemia or low blood sugar is not a good thing. So if you look, I don't know if you can read this slide very well, but if you are more newly diagnosed, a younger person, someone with a lot of resource, support, motivation, we're going to really try to get your A1C as close to normal as possible, or less than 7%. Versus someone who is older, has a lot of trouble with hypoglycemia, maybe doesn't have a lot of support, um, someone whose life expectancy is shorter, has a lot of other complications with other medical problems, we might accept a higher A1C. So I just want I want to put that caveat in, that's important. And so that's something you discuss with your doctor. What is my target? You should know that. Ask your doctor, what is my A1C target? Um, so if some of you may know and some of you may not know that your blood glucose constantly fluctuates throughout the day. So if let's say you check your blood sugar once a day in the morning and you say, oh, my glucose is good, it was 100. But if you're not checking it throughout the day, um, and I'm not saying you should, but it, just know that it's not always, you know, it's going up and down from that 100. It may, especially after you've eaten, carbohydrate may change quite a bit. Um, so that's why we rely on the A1C to give an average of that glucose over three months. Um, and these are some goals that, um, you know, each, each person's goal will be different, but this is a generalization. So pre-meal, I like to have... Uh, folks, glucose 90 to 130, and then post-meal, um, two hours after they've eaten, one, less than 160. So it's good just to, you want to know what you're shooting for. So, and you can discuss that with your doctor as well. Um, also want to mention hypoglycemia. So um, that's just as important as hyperglycemia. So hypoglycemia is low blood glucose. If you are on medications for diabetes, you can develop hypoglycemia as a side effect of those medications, okay? And hypoglycemia is a serious problem in, in the sense that if your glucose goes too low, you can get confused, you can make poor decisions, you could pass out, you could get into a car accident. So um, if you're on, let's say, insulin, then you really want to be monitoring your glucose and, and monitoring for low blood glucose. So... Um, I, this, is, this comes from me, but I would say if your glucose is, are in the 70s or lower, <clears throat> you should let your doctor know. You should, even if you feel perfectly fine, it's, it's, a, it's usually those really 
symptomatic hypoglycemic episodes are preceded by glucoses in the 70s. So, you know, watch for that too. Um, it's, it's a balance. Of course, you don't want to be too high, but you don't want to be too low. So you want to watch for both. Um, and that's more of the same. Okay, so I am going to just briefly talk about the medications. I'm, I really am not going to spend a lot of time on these, but um, there's so many medication now. In fact, what's interesting is before 1995, so in 1995, metformin was introduced, which was known as glucophage. But before 1995, there was only two classes of medication to treat type 2 diabetes, and that was insulin and drugs like gliburide, you know, like uh, they're called sulfonylureas, um, glipizide. That was it. And then 1995 came and metformin or glucophage was introduced. And, and there's just really, I would say in the last decade, 15 years, there's just been an explosion of new diabetes medications. But um, so metformin is really recommended first line. Um, there, there are some very recent guidelines that, that suggest otherwise, but for years, metformin has really been the first go-to medication. And it works by decreasing the hepatic glucose production. So the liver's production of glucose that we we're talking about. That's how that works, basically. I mean, there is some insulin sensitizing effect, but, but the main way that you're getting glucose lowering is that on, uh, the effect on uh, gluconeogenesis from the liver. So metformin um, is an oral medication. It's, um, if, if your kidney function is normal, it's really a good medication to, to take. You can develop gastrointestinal side effects from this medication. So some folks have diarrhea on it, nausea. Usually if you take it with food um, and titrate slowly, the, those symptoms subside. So that, that's a, a very good medication to take. Um, so phonyureas are drugs that cause the pancreas to produce insulin. So with those, you do have risk for hypoglycemia, but those are also like metformin uh, most times generic and inexpensive. Um, the third class of medication is the thiazolidine diones, and those came out around 2000, I want to say. Um, so you may have heard of Avandia, Resilin, Actos. Those are all in that category. Um, really, the main one used now is Actos, or it does come generic, Pioglitazone. And that is known as an insulin sensitizer, which causes your tissues to become more sensitive to insulin. Um, with that, that drug, um, you can develop some fluid retention, so that's something we watch for, weight gain. Um, so with metformin, there's weight loss. With sulfonylurea, there's a little weight gain. And then the other class of oral medications are the SGLT2 inhibitors, which are fairly new, a um, couple years. So you may see them on the ads on TV, Invokana, Farsiga, and Jardians. And these are really work on a novel mechanism. So they work on the sodium glucose co-transporter in the kidney. So they cause more glucose excretion in the urine. So you are excreting glucose through the urine, and, uh, and, and they're very effective. Um, you know, you, you can't use them if, you have, if your kidney function is, is at a certain level, but those can be quite good as well. Um, and then there's several injectable medications. So the, the class of GLP-1 agonists include Bayetta, which came out first, and then there's Victoza. Those are, those are, these are all injections. Um, these are not insulin, so they're GLP-1 agonists. Trulicity is once a week by Durian, and the newest one is Ozempic. Um, so when I, I don't know if you recall the slide I showed you with the, the stomach. That's where that... Um, GLP-1 agonist works. So it is it uses the incretin effect. So where the GLP-1 agonist causes the, ins the pancreas to produce some insulin and the liver to produce a little less glucose and slow gastric emptying so you're a little fuller. And they can be quite effective in lowering glucose. Um, of course, these are, you know, the SGLT2, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 agonists are, are more expensive. Um, 
I didn't put on here. I just realized on the oral medications, there's another class called the DPP-4 inhibitors. So you may see these. Um, they're like Genuvia, um, Trigenta. And so they also work on that incretin pathway. And so, and they're very safe. So even if you have kidney, kidney problems, you can take them and they have very few side effects, no weight gain. Um, and then we have insulin. So really insulin is the most potent way to lower your glucose levels. So if you're, you know, usually what happens is folks have tried the oral medications and they're not able to achieve the A1C they wish. And so insulin is introduced. Insulin can also be very good if you have other medical problems, like if you're undergoing chemotherapy or if you're on steroids, um, or if you have kidney problems, liver problems, it, it's a very, it's a drug that can be used safely. Um, so there's basal insulin, which is once a day. And just to keep your glucose level, it's a, it's a very flat um, duration of action. Whereas the rapid acting insulins are faster and they, they may be taken before meals. How many of you are on insulin? Are any of you on insulin? Okay, so not that many. Okay. Um, and then newer um, is the inhaled insulin of Freza. So that's a novel, <clears throat> novel drug that um, is very small. The first, the first iteration of that was called Exubra. It was very clunky and didn't do very well. So, um, so now there's a, a very small portable um, inhaled insulin called Efreza that you can take before meals. So I know everybody likes to know the latest technology, so I'll just mention, um, and you know, this may not pertain to you, especially if you have type 2 diabetes, because they're, more, they're used more in type 1. But I do have patients with type 2 diabetes who use these also. So an insulin pump is where the insulin is kept in that little uh, rectangular container. It's like a, sort of like a pager. And so there's a cartridge that is filled with short-acting insulin. And then there's a tube, a very thin plastic tube that comes out and is inserted under the skin at a very superficial level. So it's just subcutaneous. And so there's a constant infusion of insulin. So usually type 1 patients use this. Um, let's say 0.5 units an hour. It's just being constantly infused. And then every time you eat carbohydrate, you can program that to give yourself a bolus of insulin for that meal. So that's, that's the insulin pump. So it's just a, it's a way to administer your insulin, really, um, that's with you all the time. Now, on the other side, see that little... Um, that real rectangle on the uh, right side of the patient. Um, that is called a continuous glucose monitor. So actually, you may see some ads now on TV for Freestyle Libre. I don't know if you see that. They say, oh, you, can't, you don't need to finger stick. But what it is is it's um, also subcutaneously inserted, and it's reading your interstitial fluid for your glucose. And so this... This uh, data is sent to um, a reader. Could be it could be your iPhone, um, and you would get real time glucose readings um, that are that. And there's a lot of data, so you would actually see trends instead of just one reading with a finger stick. You would see what happens when when you're sleeping, what happens to your glucose when you eat a big meal, when you exercise, and so for folks with type one diabetes who are prone to hypoglycemia or large fluctuations, it's, it's very helpful. Um, these are some apps that I would recommend if you wanted to um, look at these to help, some tools to help you control your glucose. Um, there's one called Glucose Buddy, basically to help log your, your glucose. Um, there's, there's an app called MyFitnessPal that helps you track your calories, and you can also look at the carbohydrate intake. Um, Calorie King is also another huge database where you can search foods that you're eating and see how many calories and how much carbohydrate they're in. Um, My Sugar and Diabetes Connector are, are similar to Glucose Buddy, but if, if you're someone who likes apps and uses your phone a lot, it's a way to um, engage and track your diabetes. 
So tips for success. So my takeaways, um, you know, focus on the positive. Sometimes folks get discouraged because they're, they're you know, not where they want to be. But if you look at, sometimes if you just look at where you've come from and look at the progress you've made, you, you want to, it's, it's a marathon, it's a chronic disease, it's something, there may be times where you go off and it gets more difficult, but then you just go back and you try again. Um, and then just small, even small changes. So you might not be able to do everything you, you plan to do, but if you did one thing, just step in the right direction, that's good. Um, really communicate with your doctor. So a lot of my patients tell me that they're not telling their doctor if, they, if they're not taking them. A lot of people are not taking their medication and they don't they don't want to mention it. I'm not sure why. <laughs> so, but that's important for your doctor to know. Um, or, um, you know, if, or if you're trying some, you know, for whatever reason, some people are trying, they want to try something new. They want to try something natural on their own. But just, I think you're, it's better for your doctor to know um, what you're doing, what you're eating. <laughs> um, and, then, and then leverage your support system. So if you have family, friends in your life, um, you know, get them on board. Like, let them know what your goals are. Help, ask them to help you stay accountable to, um, to exercise, to diet, because they may not realize what your, what your glucose goals are and what you, what you need to get there. So they're going to help you. Um, track your progress. Talked about that. Even keeping a food diary is helpful. If you just write down everything you eat, if you check your sugar, it's going, you're going to pay attention. You won't ignore it. So I think that's, that's um, important. Okay, so you, every year you should have a dilated eye exam. So if you have diabetes, um, you're, you want to let your eye doctor know that. Um, you need to have a urine microalbumin, so it's just a little urine specimen, and a foot exam. And then really be aware of your blood pressure and cholesterol. Like I said, I mean, most folks with diabetes, um, the cause of death is not uh, retinopathy or nephropathy. It's a stroke or heart attack. So, so controlling your diabetes and your cholesterol and your blood pressure is very important. So, um, you know, it's easy just to focus on their sugars, but the blood pressure and cholesterol are, are as, if not more important than, uh, than controlling your sugars in, in some cases. And then I, I said this before, but don't compare your diabetes to someone else. So someone else may be able to eat and cheat, and their A1C is good, and you may not. So you just have to look at your own physiology. I mean, you're not, your genetics is different, and um, like I said, it's a very heterogeneous disease. So um, yeah, you're not, you're not going to be just like your spouse or your friend, you know. Um, Okay, who do I turn to for help and support? So outside, we had a booth from the Queens Medical Center Diabetes Education, and they're, they're wonderful. So um, they have classes for folks with diabetes, and really, you can go there yearly. You, so if you've, if you've gone once, it doesn't mean you can't go back. And they even have classes for people, folks with pre-diabetes that insurance covers. Um, and then the other office that was there was the American Diabetes Association. There's also In Control with Kevin Cam on Baratania, and he's great. Um, at one uh, organization I forgot to mention, that I didn't mention that someone reminded me is, there is the Ekahi Ornish program. That is not a program for diabetes, but um, it's wonderful for lifestyle modification. Its um, focus is to prevent cardiac disease. So um, they're wonderful for um, exercise, diet change, you know, getting your blood pressure, cholesterol under control. And then, uh, and then if you haven't been to the TCOYD conference, um, it's in April at the convention center, and that's, that's always great. They've got um, lots of booths and speakers, and Steve Edelman uh, from California runs it. He has type 1 diabetes himself, but it's very engaging, and I encourage you all to go. And I think that's the end. Yeah, that's the end. Of okay, thank you, Dr. Walker. Yeah. At this time, we're going to open the floor to questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll come down to you. Anyone? Question? Oh, okay. 
pancreas is producing insulin, right? Yeah. And so if it's not producing, that means something is wrong with the pancreas, right? Is there a way to make the pancreas better? Mm, because it's question. sick at this point because it's not producing. Okay, that's a good question. So the question was, if your pancreas is not making enough insulin, then the pancreas is sick, and is there anything you can do to make the pancreas better? And that's a really good question. You know, um, there are theories about that, but to my knowledge, there's nothing that will spare, preserve your pancreas. I think, really, if you have, if you have type 1 diabetes, we don't know that. I mean, really, um, there's islet cell transplant, which is not preserving your pancreas. Um, but in someone with type 2 diabetes, really the lifestyle modification is, is important because if you lose weight, if you exercise, if you eat less carbohydrates, your pancreas doesn't have to work as hard. So um, it's not, I'm not saying you're going to reverse the, the whole disease, but it's going to be a lot easier on your pancreas if you're, if you're doing those. That's why we're always telling you you know, exercise, lose weight, <laughs> eat right, yeah. Yeah, but if you're already, you, you're not fat enough to, to lose weight, you know, you're just on the right weight. So she's saying if, well, what if you're at your good weight? And you're, you're saying you're doing all the right things. You're eating right, you're exercising. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll tell you, I will say, folks, uh, a lot of my older patients who've had diabetes for 20 years, um, they're, they are doing all the right things, and their sugar is still high. And it's because it's, it's where we are in the disease. You remember that graph? So by that time, the pancreas is already depleted. I mean, the, you know, the beta cells are already exhausted, and you know, it's at, you're just at that point in the disease. So, um, so again, you work, you work with your doctor to try and see what the best therapy is. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, if your blood sugar is higher when you get up in the morning after you slept and you didn't eat, what would cause that? Because um, yeah. that's without eating breakfast yet. Okay, so the question is, what if your glucose is higher in the morning, fasting, and you hadn't eaten anything? You know, uh, that is very common. So we call it fasting hyperglycemia, and that's all because of the liver. So the unrestrained hepatic glucose production. The liver is just producing too much glucose overnight. So it's nothing you did. I mean, that's why folks are on metformin. That's why folks need sometimes basal insulin to control that morning reading. Sometimes if you eat an earlier dinner or exercise in the evening, that helps. But it's very common, extremely common. Do we have a question here? Uh, can you make a comment about um, diet uh, sodas and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And, okay. yeah. and the other thing is uh, on fruits, fruit sugar versus, you know, all these processed sugar. Okay, so the question is to comment on diet, soda, and fruit. Okay, so I have to say, you know, I'm not a dietitian. Um, these are my opinions, so um, I'll just say that. You know, diet, I used to tell my patients that to drink diet soda because... Um, it will not raise your glucose. But since then, there are studies that show a lot of those artificial sweeteners, especially in animal studies, that, you know, it, it really changes the gut flora, and I, I don't think they're healthy at all. So really, water is the best. You could put lemon in water. Um, yeah, it's, it's you know, I, w I, th I think diet sodas are not, actually not healthy. It's just that it's an alternative for folks that are just craving something because they can't have sweets. Now, fruits, you know, um, I'd rather my patients have a piece of fruit than a chocolate bar. Um, and yet, I will say, say that pineapple, mango, lychee, you know, watermelon, if you're eating large amounts, it's just like drinking juice. I mean, it's, it's sugar. And so it's going, you're, if your glucose if your glucose is running two and 300 and you're eating a lot of those fruits, you really should cut them out. I think the berries are probably the best. Apple is good. Okay, other questions? Back. How about the use of stevia? 
Stevia, yeah. So, how, what about the use of stevia? You know, I, you know, I'm not against those artificial sweeteners, but if you can avoid them, I think it's better. It's better. That's just my opinion. But, yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. It might be dumb. I know there's no dumb questions, but every night I eat like cookies or brownies, probably like at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Am I doing myself a disservice? Or should I be eating it with protein or something like that? Okay, the question is, every night I have cookies or brownies, and am I doing myself a disservice, and should I eat it with a protein? <laughs> That's the question. You know, uh, you know our diet really is, um, needs to be improved. Just in, I mean, our whole, you know, the American diet. So there are theories that, you know, by eating a lot of sweets and carbohydrate, you're kind of, you're stressing your pancreas. But in addition, what I, you know, this is again, you know, you're, you probably are doing yourself a disservice for your uh, risk for atherosclerosis, you know, um, even if your cholesterol is normal. So, I mean, if you, not that, I mean, everyone's going to indulge and everyone's going to cheat, but if you can just do less of it and more of the healthy, like if you start, actually, if you start eating, more vegetables, you're going to feel better. You're, after a while, I mean, it might be hard in the beginning, especially if you don't like vegetables, but, but you're going to feel better and you're going to perform better. I mean, it's just, it's just better for you. So, so just, you, you know, whatever you can do to, to be a little bit, I mean, you're someone who, you don't have any trouble with your weight, so you don't feel a need to do that, but it is healthier. It's going to be healthier to eat, um, eat healthy. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? One more. You said eat more vegetables, right? But is it raw vegetables or is it cooked vegetables? There's so, a difference. So the question is eat more vegetables, raw or cooked. Either. Either is fine. I would say either. And I know some of some of my patients have end stage kidney disease and so they're or they're on a blood thinner like warfarin or coumadin, and so they're limited in their vegetable intake. So, you know, it's hard. I know everyone has their own coming from a different challenges, and, you know, um, so they are, you know, you, ha you really have to talk with your doctor and see what's best for you, but these are general, general tips. But yeah, and vegetables either way are, are good. Okay, let's give another round of applause for Dr. Lisa L. Wong. I also want to say mahalo to the American Diabetes Association. We had LJ Duenas and Phoebe, uh, Phoebe Smart, who is out there uh, giving those wonderful, those sheets that show what you can eat and how much vegetables we have to have on a plate. Oh my gosh, okay, I'm in for a lot of work. Um, and I also want to thank the Queen's Diabetes Education Center. We had the registered dietitian Judy Thompson there. We had an RN Stacy Onaga and APRN RX Reed Kawakami. They were all certified diabetes educators who were out there to talk stories. So that's one of the bonuses of coming to the live event rather than watching it, you know, in your pajamas at home. You get to meet and talk story with these folks and ask your questions and get your answers. I also want to say mahalo to our Queen's volunteers, Kelsey Castellini and Nicole Bowie. Let's give them a hand. They can hear. <laughs> and our next Speaking of Health lecture, actually, we don't have any in December. So that's going to be, this is our last one for this year. Uh, we're going to have the, the information posted at www.queens.org slash events. If you go to that, www.queens.org slash events, you're also going to find all different kinds of events like this one, which is this Saturday, uh, part of Diabetes Awareness Month. Uh, they're going to be celebrating at Queens West Oahu World Diabetes Day. Wednesday's not a good day for families, so Saturday is when from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., you can go have fun learning with the family about diabetes. They're going to have all kinds of health education things. They're going to have yoga. They're going to have qigong, a health fair, art therapy, healthy cooking demos. That is on the great lawn of the Queens Medical Center, West Oahu. And that is this Saturday, November 17, 2018, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that's going to do it for us this evening and for the year. I want to thank you guys all for coming. Don't forget to get your parking tickets validated outside with Erin and have a good night.